Let's get this started. We're, it's a slow, it's a slow, drizzly kind of day that everyone's kind of drizzling in here. So, uh, but we have a, a, a busy schedule, and we have a couple of guests today that will be uh, uh, sort of a treat here. Uh, so uh, today to go over the actual hands-on type of uh, uh, experiential abdominal and pelvic trauma, uh, we have Dr. Andrea King, who's one of the uh, uh, main trauma surgeons at Southwest, and um, Carly Schreiber, who's the trauma program manager, director. So. Um, I'm going to go through uh, a fairly quick um, uh, uh, basic science again. Uh, we'll, we'll, of course, we'll spend a lot of time on the Krebs cycle. Uh, yeah, your favorite part. There's going to be three or four tests on that. Uh, so. The abdomen, of course, is one of the body's largest cavities, multiple vital organs, large volumes of blood can be lost before signs and symptoms manifest themselves, particularly in the, uh, in the uh, pregnant uh, trauma patient. Um, have to be alert for signs of transmitted injury, deformity, swelling, ecchymosis, the DCAP, B BLS stuff. Um, the main prevention for abdominal injury, uh, besides uh, avoiding penetrating trauma, knives and guns, bullets, is highway safety, obviously, because uh, most of our trauma, and I think we went through the last uh, review of, the, uh, of our trauma series at Southwest, and I think there probably we have 98% blunt trauma. So most of the time, most it's accidents and highway accidents. Boundaries of your, uh, uh, for the abdomen, superior the diaphragm, inferior is the pelvis, posterior vertebral columns and posterior and inferior ribs. Remember the lower, uh, lower three to four ribs. Uh, if you have fractures there, you can involve both the chest and the abdomen. Uh, laterally, muscles of the flank, anteriorly, the abdominal muscles. Three specific spaces. The peritoneal space is the organs that are all covered by the peritoneal lining, the abdominal lining. Now, retroperitoneal, obviously, is the part behind the peritoneum, and that'll include a couple of major organs, uh, uh, kidneys and uh, uh, the duodenum, most of the duodenum, and most of the pancreas. Pelvic space, uh, organs contained within the pelvis, different obviously from males and females. Now, the peritoneum extends into the pelvic space. So peritonitis can involve, the, will involve, can involve the peritoneum, the, the pelvis as well. Your solid abdominal organs for review, liver, spleen, pancreas, kidneys, and ovaries. Hollow organs, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, gallbladder, bladder, and uterus. So hollow organs can rupture. Solid organs can be contused and basically burst apart. Stomach. What's in the stomach? Well. Food mixed with hydrochloric acid and enzymes to form what's called chyme, um, and uh, that stuff belongs inside the stomach and not outside the stomach. So ruptured, you end up with acids and, and uh, enzymes and all sorts of things into the, into the, st into the uh, peritoneum. Small bowel starts out the duodenum, transitions to the jejunum, and then to the ileum, which is most of the small bowel. The small bowel is very muscular, has a lot of, uh, 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 and that's where most of your peristalsis occurs. The large bowel is weakly muscular, musculatured, 
uh, sort of uh, uh, stripes of muscle, three stripes down it, and so there's a lot of weak spots in between. It's more likely to rupture. Rectum is actually essentially a retroperitoneal. Uh, ret rectum and anus, obviously, the end point. Liver, normally in the, in the upper right quadrant, unless you have a true situs inversus person, which I think I've seen one in 52 years of practice, <laughs> uh, receives 25% of your cardiac output at rest. So it is full of blood. It is very, and, and be, being full of blood makes it very sensitive to a, contu a contusion, to blunt force trauma. Suspended by the ligamentum teres, which is a, a remnant of the umbilical vein embryologically, and that can be torn and lacerate the liver because it's, it's a, ri it's a fairly rigid suspension. It's like a, a, a sort of like a wire, uh, and it can, the liver in deceleration injury can tear uh, across that, the ligamentum teres. Function of the liver is to detoxify blood, uh, and it produces bilirubin and uh, liver bile as uh, it, your byproduct of, produce, of detoxifying blood. Uh, repla replaces most of your iron, I mean, retains most of your iron stores uh, in the blood. You know, blood cycles every 110 to 120 days, basically. Um, so all damaged, aged erythrocytes are removed, and then the, the iron stores are removed for that and become uh, bilirubin. Of course, bilirubin uh, in the in the liver bile is what turns stool browny, brown in color. So if your liver is not functioning, you're not producing liver bile and bilirubin, then you become icteric, become, uh, you become, skin becomes yellowish because of the bilirubin that's now circulating in the blood. It's not coming out in, the, in, in your liver bile. And stool becomes pasty white in color. That's characteristic of hepatitis, for example. Liver also stores glycogen and other metabolic agents. Uh, now, if you remove a portion of the liver, it generally will grow back to, it can regenerate to its normal size following partial removal. Dr. King could probably speak more to that. Gallbladder, small hollow organ, so it's a hollow organ, it can rupture. It's located behind and beneath the liver, receives bile, uh, and it's just, and it's a storage facility. And then when you, when you ingest fatty foods, uh, as that reaches the duodenum where the common bile duct comes into the duodenum, it then um, discharges the uh, bile in there, which helps fats, emulsifies fats and helps digestion. Pancreas produces both endocrine hormones and exocrine hormones. So glucagon and insulin are the primary hormones and then enzymes, digestive enzymes to help digest proteins um, and actually turns the chyme, that, because it's basic, it term, turns the, it's a base, and it turns the chyme, which is mixed with hydrochloric acid from the stomach it returns that to a normal, to a n more normal pH, f so it can be digested in the uh, in, in the uh, and absorbed in the intestine. Spleen is part of your immune system. Low and very, we've discovered very very important. 
helps to prevent sepsis, pneumococcal sepsis, things like that. So it's really nice to keep a spleen nowadays. Uh, so uh, when, I start, when I started in medicine, if anybody came in with the this vaguest suggestion that, the sp that a spleen was, was injured, bleeding slightly, that spleen was gone. That would be on the table for, uh, for the pathologist to review. Now we don't do that. It's located behind the stomach, lateral to the kidney, left upper quadrant. Its main function is immunological, but it also, because it's immunological, it has a lot of blood flow at the time, so it stores blood. So there's probably uh, uh, a pretty close to 500 cc's of blood available in an in adult spleen for es essentially an autotransfusion. But because it's so fragile, it can then, it can bleed. If you rupture the, uh, the capsule around the spleen, then it bleeds into the abdomen, into the peritoneum. Urinary system compl consists essentially of kidneys. We've, we've had, we've talked and we, about the function of the kidney and the, the physiology of kidneys before. We won't go into that now, but it basically simply collects waste products from blood, concentrates those into the urine, reabsorbs water and salt, and it helps regulate body's os osmotic balance and also helps to regulate blood pressure. The adrenal glands are superior and attached to the kidneys. They're endocrine. They produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. Ureters are si uh, simply collecting tubes. So there's a couple of a uh, couple of of hangups in the in the ureter, uh, narrow spots first as it exits the kidney. There's a slight narrowing, so kidney stones hang up at this spot often. Um, then there's a narrowing spot as, it, as the ureter goes over the brim of the pelvis. That's another place it can hang up. And then there's another narrowed area as it enters the bladder. So kidney stones commonly start, you have pain in the flank, and, and it moves down, as the stone moves, the pain moves down the lateral aspect of the abdomen down into the groin. Urinary bladder contains as much as 500 cc's of urine. I think actually can sometimes contain more than that, uh, but that's an average. Uh, so if it's full of urine, it's a hollow but full of urine at that point with blunt force trauma, particularly if the, uh, uh, if the uh, pelvis is involved, the pubis is involved, you can rupture the bladder. The urethra, uh, about a centimeter long in the female, a little bit longer in males, uh, and uh, it's you know, straddle type injuries uh, would be uh, that the urethra is at risk. Pelvic anatomy, female sexual organs, it's a potential open passage to the interior of the abdominal cavity. But the pelvic genitalia for females, ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, vagina. Male sexual organs are all external, testes, penis. Key vessels to worry about in the abdomen and pelvis. Abdominal aorta, main blood supply to the abdomen, left of the spinal column, the inferior vena cava is right of the spinal column or right over the spinal column often. And the iliac arteries are the bifurcation of the aorta and the upper sacral level, and then those uh, exit and become the femoral arteries. Portal system is the venous subsystem, collects venous blood, 
fluid and nutrients absorbed by the bowel. So it comes from, you know, the portal. The end of the portal system is the hemorrhoidal veins. The other end is the, of the portal system is at the, uh, is in the esophagus, the distal esophagus. So when you get increased portal venous pressure, you get distended hemorrhoids, you get distended, and, and hemorrhoids are just big veins, and you get uh, p the potential for uh, large veins in distal esophagus, which can then rupture and bleed. Portal system collects all your nutrients, transports it to the liver for detoxification, for storage of excess nutrients, glucose stored as glycogen, fats, excess fats are stored as fats, and adds deficient nutrients the, uh, uh, from the liver. The peritoneum is a serous member. Serous meaning it produces, it, uh, it produces, it, ex it exudes fluid. So the, there's a slight, there's a, the peritoneum is slick. It feels slick when you're, it's, it's moist. It's got a serous covering. Um, surrounds most of the abdominal cavity, covers most of the small bowel, some of the abdominal organs. There's a little bit of fluid in between the peritoneal layers so the things slide back and forth nicely. Um, sometimes when, that, so when you have an infection, when you have a previous surgery, when you have an inflammatory process, you get um, um, adhesions. You get uh, little scars, little sticky parts in between the peritoneal layers and that's what, you know, and then you get pain from that, from the from adhesions, you get sometimes that's the point where the bowel can obstruct. It turns around this adhesed layer. Uh, the peritoneum is reflected as a mesentery across the uh, in, in the abdomen. It, it helps to support the bowel um, and keep it separated. And, and then there's a an additional fold of mesentery called the omentum, which is sort of like an apron that sort of folds over the anterior surface of the, uh, of the gut of the intestines underneath the abdomen. So it, it's all part of the peritoneal system. Retroperitoneally, behind the peritoneum, you have the kidneys, the duodenum, the pancreas, the urinary bladder, portion of the colon, the rectum, and major vascular structures. They're behind the parent. Now, that's important because if you have an injury to the, du let's say, an injury to the duodenum, um, if you have an injury to the small bowel and it's leaking, you get develop, or inf infection, you develop peritonitis. If you have an injury to the duodenum and it's leaking retroperitoneally, you won't get peritonitis, but the, it'll, you'll get pain. You probably get back pain more than anything else. So it's, it, can be, it can be a real fooler. That's why you have to be cognizant that the seatbelt injury, that uh, injury to the upper abdomen may have injured the duodenum, and even though you don't have peritoneal signs, um, which is pain, um, you may, uh, it may significantly have injured the, uh, and you may, uh, may be leaking, may be bleeding from the duodenum, the, ki the pancreas also when it's inflamed or injured will often or mostly re be reflected not as abdominal pain, but as back pain. So, what are the mechanisms of abdominal injury? Well, penetrating trauma will get rid of, uh, like I say, we only see a, a couple percent of penetrating traumas happily. Now there are, there are places you could be a paramedic where you'd see a lot more penetrating trauma. Um, uh, 
in penetrating trauma, energy is transmitted from the projectile or the, or the knife to surrounding tissue. So it can result in uncontrolled hemorrhage, uh, organ damage by pressure uh, and energy expansion, uh, spillage of hollow organ contents into the peritoneum, and irritation and inflammation, which is peritonitis. The liver is the most uh, af commonly affected organ. Um, um, little note in this one that says shotgun trauma. Don't forget there are multiple multiple projectiles plus a lot of a lot of energy <laughs> expended. Blunt trauma produces the least visible signs of injury. Obviously, you can see a uh, a laceration. You can see a bullet wound easier. Uh, the main causes of uh, blunt trauma are deceleration uh, injuries. Uh, you st the car stops, you go, your body goes suddenly forward and then it slams into the seat belt or slams into the steering wheel or something inside. So, and you stop and the large, heavy, solid organs keep going forward. That's a deceleration injury. Also, you can compress organs between other structures. Uh, there's a shear when part of an organ is able to move uh, while another part is fixed. Though, so in the case of the liver, you can, you get it's a type of shearing injury to tear the lig at the ligamentum teres. Blast injuries. Uh, there are both blunt and penetrating mechanism, mechanisms present here. So uh, in, with shrapnel, it's irregularly shaped and debris, it's, it's transmitting uh, variable amounts of uh, energy. Not only is it making an entry wound, but it's because of the shape and the size, there's, there's energy expended then into the, uh, into the body. A pressure wave can cause um, compress and then relax air-filled organs, so you can rupture uh, hollow organs by pressure wave itself. Um, abdominal injury is a secondary concern during blast injury. Uh, there are other, uh, you know, chest injuries, lung injuries. Um, uh, heart, head, brain may take precedence. The injury to the abdominal wall, skin and muscle transmit blunt trauma, uh, and you can see erythema, swelling, and ecchymosis. Penetrating trauma might be minimal, uh, particularly a knife, unless uh, you get a large slashing kind of injury like this one, um, uh, which actually resulted in an evisceration. Uh, 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 that's, uh, that's pretty hard to miss. Uh, uh, muscle itself may mask the size of the external wound. Uh, uh, Injury to the abdominal wall, so trauma to thorax, buttocks, flanks, and back may penetrate the abdomen and the lower chest injury. If you have lower chest injuries, you, you, you're at risk for spleen, liver, stomach, and gallbladder. Diaphragmatic tears, her, get her, you can get herniation of the abdominal contents into the thorax. We see that reasonably commonly. Hollow organs may rupture with compression from blunt forces, may tear due to penetrating trauma. When you spill the contents of a hollow organ into the retroperitoneal space, uh, you get pain and inflammatory signs retroperitoneally in the back. Into the peritoneal space, you get peritoneal signs, which are pain, generalized ultimately, but localized, and then you get rebound. Rebound tenderness, you've 
and you press on the, you press on the abdomen and move, remove your hand quickly. If it hurts worse as you're coming off, that's called rebound. They don't usually like you to do it more than once if they're awake. It's not something we use as a demo, like, oh, come over here and take a look at this one. Look what happens when I push here. Um, intestines have a large amount of bacteria, obviously, and normal bacteria when they're inside the gut, not normal when they're outside the gut. So if you leak into the peritoneum, you end up with peritonitis, in, uh, 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 bacterial peritonitis, which will go on to sepsis. Signs of bleeding, signs of blood loss from abdominal trauma could include, if you don't have penetrating or you just have a blunt trauma, they could have blood in the stool, they could have hematemesis, bloody vomit, and they can have hematuria, blood in the urine, where we check for all those things. Solid organs are dense, but squishy. They're fragile. So they're prone to contusion, prone to bleeding, prone to fracture. The spleen will fracture. And there'll be unrestricted hemorrhage if the capsule of that organ is compromised. So if you have a spleen injury and it's bleeding inside but the capsule is intact, it doesn't get out into the, it's usually not unrestricted bleeding. It's when, it's, it's when the capsule is ruptured, then there's no, you know, if the capsule stays together, you have X amount of pressure that builds up, and that will stop the bleeding. If, you, if the capsule is ruptured, it will continue to bleed, then there's no restriction. It will bleed into the, into the abdomen. It doesn't clot. So, classically, if you have spleen injury, leaking, uh, you're leaking blood, you have pain, pain from spleen injury is generally referred to the left shoulder, left shoulder blade. So if you had a person complaining of pain in their left lateral ribs, they got hit from a, a on a, 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 a if they got hit on the passenger or the driver's side and they have a left chest injury, may have fractured ribs, but if they complain, you know, they have pain in the left upper quadrant, possibly on palpation, but they also complain of pain in their left shoulder, you've got a high index of suspicion for a spleen injury. Pancreas, pain generally radiates to the back, sort of high back, sort of in between the lower portion of the shoulder blade. Kidney, pain radiates from the flank to the groin, and they may have hematuria as well. Liver, um, liver and gallbladder, depending on how, uh, where the injury, they're going to have right upper quadrant discomfort, and they may also have right shoulder blade pain. When you get blood underneath the diaphragm on the right side, it generally, it generally have pain in the right scapular area as well. Vascular structures can be injured, obviously. Uh, penetrating trauma, of course, is a big one there, but uh, Abdominal aorta and vena cava are prone to direct blunt or penetrating trauma, may be injured in deceleration injuries. When blood accumulates beneath the diaphragm, produces referred pain, like I said, to the shoulder area. 
presence of blood in the abdomen stimulates the vagus nerve. It slows the heart rate down. Blood can isolate in any of the abdominal spaces. And the basic rule is, you know, when, when the patient is sitting up or in an upright position in a car and they're bleeding, that blood is going to be, it flows downhill simply by gravity. When you lay them on their back, it has a tendency to then distribute itself and uh, just simply by gravity again will layer out and go into the what are called the gutter spaces of the, uh, of the abdomen. That's when it'll get under your diaphragm. You won't have any diaphragmatic pain if they're sitting up if the blood is pooled down low. Uh, now, the mesentery um, supports the bowel, but it also sub yes, physically supports the bowel, but it also provides the bowel. That's how all the circulation, all the blood supply and innervation gets to the bowel. So if you tear the mesentery, you can disrupt the necessary blood vessels to that portion of the bowel and lead to is ischemia, to necrosis, or to rupture. Peritoneal layers, uh, if you tear them out, it, it, it doesn't, it, it sort of gets trapped in this, um, uh, in the peritoneal layers, the layering of things, and it, and it often uh, masks a fairly significant hemorrhage. Tear of the mesentery may rupture the bowel itself. Penetrating trauma to the lateral abdomen will likely injure the large bowel, because the large bowel ascends, then dives across underneath the diaphragm, basically, and then descends on the left side. So it's, it's and it's bigger, it's kind of gas-filled often, and, it's got, and it can be, it can easily be injured. Peritone, the peritoneum is very sensitive, it has a lot of nerves. Peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum due to either bacterial irritation due to torn bowel or an open wound or to some or peritonitis from a ruptured appendix, uh, a hollow uh, organ. Uh, chemical irritation, caustic nature of the uh, digestive enzymes causes chemical peritonitis. Uh, urine indicates uh, or initiates inflammatory, so you rupture the bladder and it spills into the peritoneum, you will get a uh, peritonitis. Uh, blood itself doesn't induce peritonitis because blood is not particularly an irritating substance. Injury to the peritonitis, this is a fairly uh, uh, nasty looking straddle type injury. Um, uh, because the, because the um, pelvis, the skeletal part of the pelvis, uh, the bones of the pelvis are extremely well uh, supplied with blood, you can get severe life-threatening hemorrhage from pelvic injuries. Uh, the, the, the old rule was for every pelvic fracture you could count on, for every fracture of a bone in the pelvis, you could count on the, uh, 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 about a, one unit, uh, one adult unit of uh, blood loss. So, uh, and the old rule is, is generally, there's generally two pelvic fractures for, uh, because the pelvis is a, is a ring, it's hard to fracture just in one place. So you often get two, two injuries. Uh, when you fracture the bones of the pelvis, the potential injury to pelvic organs of the, uh, include the ureter, the bladder can be ruptured, lacerated, 
the urethra can be lacerated. Female genitalia can be injured. The prostate can be injured if there's a pubic fracture. Rectum and anus are at risk in pelvic fractures as well. In pregnancy, trauma is the number one killer of pregnant females. Uh, penetrating abdominal trauma uh, accounts for about 30 percent of, uh, of maternal mortality. Um, uh, obviously, that's penetrating trauma is is not is not blunt motor vehicle trauma. It's it's homicidal type of uh, trauma. Uh, gunshot wounds account for 40 to 70 percent of penetrating trauma. Blunt trauma in pregnancy uh, uh, is significantly um, worsened by improperly worn seat belts. And of course, seat belts don't really fit terminal pr pregnant women very well. Um, but so still, even though uh, gunshot wounds and, uh, you know, account for about a third of all uh, uh, of the mortality in pregnancy, uh, auto collisions are still the number one cause. Now, the uterus obviously gets bigger as the baby gets bigger. The uterus sort of protects the abdominal organs, but the fetus and the uterus itself are at risk then in uh, motor vehicle trauma particularly. And uh, you need to look at a couple of things. Uh, at, at 20 weeks, um, the, the height of the uterus is generally right about the umbilicus. But the, and the, ba the baby is still primarily, and the uterus is still primarily abdominal. As the, as the baby is getting bigger, at, at 36 weeks, the, the uterus is right up underneath the diaphragm. At 40 weeks, it begin, it's dropped generally to about two, two to three centimeters below the diaphragm. And you say, well, how in the world can that happen? Well, the baby, the, the uterus is kind of going a little bit more forward, and the baby's head generally is dropping into the pelvis now. But in that last, in that 20, from 20 to 40 weeks, that's the big, that's the big danger for the uterus in a, in a blunt trauma injury. Uh, depending on the, where the placenta is, the placenta can be sheared, uh, the placenta can be injured, the baby itself can be injured, you can get a contusion across the, um, um, across the uh, uterus itself. Now, in during pregnancy, maternal circulatory blood increases by 45%. Greater blood volume, but it's relatively fewer red blood cells. So it's, so the blood is somewhat anemic, if you will. There's more of it, but the oxygen carrying capacity is somewhat decreased because of, because it's less, less red cells. Cardiac output is also increasing by 40%. So you've got 45% more blood and it's, your heart's pumping faster and more efficiently. So the cardiac output is going at now 40%. Remember though, the, even though the cardiac output is good, the blood pressure is not elevated normally. Heart rate increases by about 15 beats per minute. The vena cava 
uh, if in the in the third trimester of pregnancy, so the last 12, 13 weeks, uh, if the if the woman is laying on her back, that heavy uterus compresses the vena cava and restricts blood flow to the uh, to the circuit to the uh, inferior vena cava, which restricts blood flow to the to your heart, which ultimately drops your pressure, your blood pressure. It's just a simple matter of not getting enough um, return to the heart. Uterus increases in size, increases maternal blood volume during pregnancy. So that's the relatively protects the mother from hypovolemia. There's more blood, so it kind of, kind of, you could lose more blood, and still not show any signs of beginning shock. Um, so you need to lose 30 to 35 percent of blood before you have signs of shock, versus 20 percent for normal non-pregnant. The uterus is really thick and muscular, so if it takes a blunt force trauma across the anterior portion of the uterus, it distributes that force relatively uniformly around the uterus to the fetus, which sort of reduces some of the chance of injury. It's sort of like the, and, and the uterus is fluid-filled as well. Uh, so it's sort of like a hydraulic shock absorber. So it'll, it'll take X amount of force and still the baby is protected. However, the placenta, depending on where that placenta is, that may take a larger part of the, because the placenta cannot stretch and absorb shock as well. Your uterine and fetal injury risk from blunt trauma increases with the length of the gestation. Penetrating trauma obviously uh, uh, is a different story, and with penetrating trauma, if you, you get maternal, let's say a knife stab or a bullet, you get uh, maternal blood mixing perhaps with placental or with fetal blood itself, and that can ultimately be a problem with the, with, if there's an RH issue with the baby, so maternal and, and fetal uh, uh, blood mix is, is not necessarily good. Blunt trauma uh, complications, uterus can rupture, the placenta can abrupt or tear away, and you can have a premature rupture of the amniotic sac, so, uh, uh, and that then provides uh, a, put a potential source of bacterial infection to the, to the fetus. Now with kids, we have to talk about kids, though. You know, with children, children have relatively poorly developed abdominal musculature, smaller in diameter, the rib cage is more cartilaginous and is easy, more easily transmits injury to the organs. Uh, the abdomen with that weaker abdominal muscular can transmit blunt force trauma to the, to the organs much easier. Little kids, children compensate very well for blood loss. The only thing that happens is that generally they increase their heart rate. So they may not show signs or symptoms until they've lost up to 50% of blood. So we, so, but they will show, so they won't be hypotensive to your, with the, with the standard blood pressure exam, but they will show signs of, of decreased perfusion. They'll have tachycardia, probably a little tachypnea, and they will have um, a, uh, 
uh, decrease capillary fill. But they won't be shocky in that sense. So your, your, your job is to anticipate that, yes, this could be blood loss, and we need, we need to deal with them as a major trauma, and we need to get them to a pediatric trauma center. Pelvic fractures, um, stable, there are stable pelvic fractures, solitary fractures of the ischial ramus. Uh, it's a real common pelvic fracture, uh, most common stable fracture, uh, often seen in osteoporotic uh, females, so uh, old ladies with uh, uh, simple ground level sit falls uh, may fracture uh, iliac wing. Uh, the Malgaigne fracture, uh, it's the most common unstable fracture, uh, about 14% of all pelvic fractures. It's a sh vertical shearing, involves both anterior and posterior arch uh, of, so through the pubis and sacrum. So, uh, results in a double vertical fracture, um, and is pretty unstable. Straddle fractures, uh, sort of like that, the, the beginning picture of that, uh, uh, ec the external view of a very nasty uh, uh, straddle fracture, uh, often gets a bilateral fracture of both, of all pubic rami. Uh, fracture fragments are usually elevated, and this is associated, as you can imagine, with urethral and bladder injuries in about 20%. Pelvic dislocation, severe trauma, so this is the sprung pelvis, uh, uh, and that's obviously usually associated with, g with a uh, general urinary injury, uh, and you can see that pubis is widely separated, the whole, uh, in that the, 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 the sacrum is also involved, and, it's, and you get an open, an open book pelvis. Posterior rim fractures, so this one, this person, unfortunate person, uh, uh, probably was a motor vehicle and jammed both, uh, both feet underneath the uh, uh, dashboard and ends up with a, a fracture of both femurs and a uh, acetabular fracture on the left uh, with a posterior dislocation of the hip. Um, a lot of blunt, a lot of, lot of, a lot of force went through that, uh, and there's going to be some, uh, a fair amount of bleeding, both from the femur fractures and from uh, the pelvic injury. All right, your assessment. Scene size up, so mechanism of injury, especially with blunt force trauma. Mechanism of injury it helps us to assess the serious of, seriousness of the injury. Identify the strength, direction of forces, mental list of possible organs involved. If you have a chest, if you have a high chest contusion, you're not necessarily worried about so much about intra-abdominal injury. But if you've, uh, if you've got seat belts, if you've got a seat belt sign here, um, Look to see if seatbelts are worn, if they're worn properly, uh, if there's interior signs in that vehicle of, uh, of impact and, and or compromise of the passenger compartment. Simple thought processes, frontal impact of an auto compresses the abdomen, liver, spleen, hollow organs. Right impact, so right side, liver, ascending colon, and pelvis potential, so a T-bone. Left impact, spleen, descending colon, and pelvis. Children and pedestrians, abdominal injuries are common. Gunshot wounds, we, it's nice to know 
type and caliber of weapon, <laughs> obviously, whether the assailant's still on scene, that's your safety. Initial assessment, I want level of consciousness, whether there's drug or alcohol use, that may mask their sense of an injury, their appreciation of their own injury. As you evaluate airway, breathing, and circulation, be observant for associated signs and symptoms of hypovolemia. So, are they breathing rapidly? Are they, are, are they tachycardic? Are they or are they not hypotensive? Uh, remember, there. If you're if you're doing a, if, uh, I, I like to see entitled CO2s, the nasal on the na if a person is. That's still a good sign to think when when, when someone has a major injury and they're in shock, they're also producing lactic, they're, they're, they become acidotic, lactic acidotic. So they're, a CO2 is, uh, an entitled CO2 is a good, is a good tip off that they may well be acidotic because if it's a low CO2, they may be compensating for their they may be compensating for their acidosis by blowing off CO2. So they will get a lower CO2. Now, that's a, that's a poor man's cheap way of doing, of checking for lactic acidosis. Rapid trauma assessment. So rapid and full trauma expose, examine for uh, signs of, of contusions for uh, 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 lacerations, for ecchymoses, for, you know, all the signs of potential injury. Obviously, if they have a penetrating trauma, it's, that's a quick one. If suspected pelvic injury, don't, you don't need to test the pelvis. Look for leg length discrepancy, external rotation. So, if you really suspect a pelvic injury, the guy's laying there with external rotation, you, you can see, you don't try to make it get bigger. Palpate the entire abdomen. Evaluate for entrance and, and exit wounds. Um, go through the QPOR, uh, the OPQRST thing, ask for the last, you know, there, there any, any medications that, you know, uh, Try to, if they're awake, try to ascertain when they last ate. A uh, couple of things. Characteristic of the pain, tenderness. So palpate the abdomen, it hurts versus rebound. It hurts when you come off. Get your sample history, particularly medications, last meal, etc. Vital assessment. With pregnant patients, be observant for signs of shock, which are not going to develop until you're 30% of blood volume loss. So tachycardia and tachypnea may be the earliest tip-off. <coughs> Supine hi hypotensive syndrome, the vena cable syndrome, so you want to transport them in the left lateral recumbent. Premature contractions, they, uh, be aware that they may have premature contractions if, uh, uh, and vaginal hemorrhage. This could be uterine rupture versus abruptual placenta. It's not your job to figure that out. That's, a, that's an exercise of, of, of increasing the diesel output. Trend your vital signs. If they're unstable, I want to see it every five minutes if you can. That doesn't mean you have to take a, a full set of vital signs every day. But if they're tachycardic, it's easy. And, you know, you've got them on a monitor. You can easily record their tachycardia. Uh, if your blood pressure, you're probably only going to be able to get it. If it's really hypotensive, you may only get, be able to palpate it. You may not have uh, two numbers for me. 
evaluate for progressive peritonitis, progressive hemorrhage, blood pressure, capillary refill, pulse rate, pulse oximetry, SpCO2, mental status, key, skin condition, uh, and whether or not your fluid resuscitation is effective or not. General management, position the patient, position of comfort unless there's spinal injury. Flex at the knees or left lateral recumbent. If this is a trauma system entry, the patient should be, at the very least, supine, and they should be in a C-collar, unless there is, unless this will in some way compromise their respiration. <coughs> now, general shock care, um, obviously supine, begin your, begin your fluid resuscitation. Uh, if you can't start an IV in, you know, a couple of minutes, then they're going to need a, uh, an IO. Now, we are we are, we are stressing the better use of humoral I.O. for both cardiac and for trauma resuscitation. Get better flows. Specific injury, we generally leave uh, impaled objects uh, there, eviscerations, uh, just uh, 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 a saline pad covering the abdomen and transport them. Pelvic fractures, ABCs first, C-spine, treat for shock. Don't overpalpate the pelvis. Stabilize the pelvis. You all have a commercial device for stabilizing the pelvis or uh, you can use the, there are, you know, sheets if you have a, a mass traumas that you don't have enough of the, of the uh, pelvic stabilizers. Treat for shock. Hypovolemia, control external bleeding. Uh, we, this, these are from your orders. Give up to two liters of isotonic fluid as rapidly as possible or until systolic blood pressure is 90, so that's the map of about, of just slightly over 60. Neck vein, or when, if you have neck vein distension or pulmonary rales, obviously you're gonna stop giving fluids if you have rales. Or when they have normal mentation. We prefer to keep most of the, of your blunt trauma patients and for that matter, penetrating trauma patients at slightly hypotensive by your, so 90 is, for an adult male, is fairly, fairly hypotensive, relatively speaking, but uh, the more, the higher you get the blood pressure, the more they're gonna continue to bleed, generally, and the more you dilute their, their clotting factor. If, however, they have head injury and shock, we target our blood pressure a little higher, about, about 100 to 110 systolic, so a map of slightly over 50. Maintain normal ventilation rate and target your ETCO2 at, at 35. Cover exposed abdominal organs with a, with a saline and a dressing. Uh, stabilize any impaled objects. Pregnant patient, left lateral recumbent. If they're on the backboard, remember it's a trauma injury, um, tilt the board. All you're trying to do is facilitate venous return. Now, it is possible to physically move the uterus off the, if they're laying on their back, to move the uterus to the left, but that requires somebody holding it all the time. So it's, if you can, and they're stabilized on a backboard, tilt it. High flow oxygen, uh, 
if they get hypoxia, positive pressure ventilation, that's true for anybody, uh, and just maintain high index of suspicion for intra-abdominal trauma and bleeding. All right, we're going to take 10 minutes, get a little coffee, get a little break, and then Dr. King will start. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Andrea King. I'm one of the trauma surgeons over at Peace Health Southwest. Uh, just a little information about me. My uh, aspirations in life were to be a, a ski instructor because I grew up racing in Alaska, and somehow I became a doctor. Um, so I did my undergrad in Baltimore at Hopkins, and then I went home to medical school in New Mexico, and then went and did all my general surgery and trauma training out in Cleveland. So. The, uh, I came back here because I grew up in Alaska. Everyone's always like, why did you come back to Washington? Uh, but I miss the Pacific Northwest. So we're going to talk about some cases today. Uh, I'm going to go around and ask you guys questions. So just say your name so that I don't have to address you as hey you in the you know, red shirt. And uh, there will be projectiles being thrown at you. It's candy. Sorry. I had something cut out of my finger, so my aim sucks. And it <laughs> usually sucks anyway, so that didn't help. Um, we are going to go through some cases. So most of these are cases from Peace Health Southwest, actually all of them. We picked cases from Southwest over the last year and a half. Uh, and it should play a little bit off of your uh, lecture that you just had. So you guys see uh, a lot of other stuff, but we're going to talk about my favorite topic, which is trauma. Because that's all I care about, right? <laughs> you guys have to care about everything. So this is our um, quick, just the, you went through all the anatomy. But the key part is, if you know the anatomy of a person, you can guesstimate what might be injured. A lot of these cases, though, you'll see is injuries present very differently than you think they're going to present. So pretty much as a trauma surgeon, I just think everybody's effed up until I prove otherwise, OK? See, I was good there. <laughs> uh, case number one. So we have a 54-year-old gentleman. Uh, you guys come to the scene. He's clearly intoxicated. Um, he, his window shield starred. You can tell he wasn't restrained. You know, he will admit to you he wasn't restrained. Uh, and he was a motor vehicle, crashed into a pole. God knows why, okay? So you guys show up on the scene. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> You're now a part of the video record, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so go ahead, tell, tell me your name. Elisa. So Elisa, what is the first thing you're concerned about with this guy, with the starring of the windshield? Yeah. So since we're talking about the abdomen and pelvis, you guys are going to think of all these other things like you normally would, head, neck, ribs, chest, spine, but we're going to skip all that, okay? Um, <laughs> and we're going to say, I'm going to give you all a hint, all these people have something wrong in this area, okay? Because uh, that's our topic. So for this guy, uh, you're concerned about all of those things, right? But so he's a head on, so what abdominal and pelvic stuff would you be concerned about? Yeah, because he was probably high speed, right? So this guy's complaints are pretty much nothing. When he rolled into our trauma bay, his complaints were, what's wrong, y'all? She came out of my car. No complaints, OK? So this is his x-ray in the trauma bay. So that is a what? What's the generic term for that? Open book pelvic fracture, yeah. Um, open book pelvis, or uh, he, what'd you, he called it something else that I haven't heard in forever, a sprung. I was like a splurge, uh, something. That's, it's an open, open book pelvic fracture, okay? So uh, open book pelvic fracture, what are you concerned about with an open book? What am I concerned about? Blood loss. Yeah, blood loss, huge blood loss. What else, what other injuries can you have to the system? Ureter. Yeah. Bladder. Yeah. Um, so those are my big concerns. Um, here you go, y'all. Oh, gosh, I'm hitting her in the head. Okay. Uh, I might have to have Carly throw. <laughs> so, <laughs> interestingly enough, the reason I showed this guy, too, is he's not complaining of any abdominal pain. Uh, after a little while, when he sobers up, he is complaining of pelvic pain. So this is actually uh, an injury you do want to put a sheet on, a binder, 
The point is to close that space in the pubic symphysis to decrease the bleeding. It only decreases the venous bleeding though, okay? So something people don't know is the, um, if you have arterial bleeding, the binder doesn't do shit for you, okay? So, damn it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I love you. Squat. Um, so the, <laughs> And the other thing they don't realize is when we take them to IR, so say they have arterial bleeding in their pelvis, you don't take the pelvic binder off, right? Because all IR is gonna take care of is arterial. So you leave the binder on. Um, ultimately what they need is pelvic fixation. That's what's gonna stop the venous bleeding. So there's actually multiple things you can injure with these pelvic fractures. Aside from bleeding, you have all your bladder, your urethral, you know, genital injuries that you can have associated with these. Um, that are a problem. The other interesting thing about this guy that I, I picked cases with really good images. Because as you know, a lot of the cases that come in that are hot messes never have a picture done. We cut their chest open in the ED or something. The most exciting cases, I have no pictures to show you. So I tried to pick cases with pictures. So if you look right here, so here's your kidney, right? right this guy right there, that's your adrenal gland. So look at this kidney, look at that. So he has a really bad adrenal hemorrhage. We don't see those very frequently, but we do see them. Um, and they can cause you know, pain in the back, and they don't really have many long-term consequences initially, uh, but he does have a bad adrenal hemorrhage, and this was like a brilliant picture of it. So that's pelvic fracture guy. So this is second case. This is a 32-year-old male. His name was Ashley, which really threw me off. Um, but he uh, was up on a roof working, you guys brought him in, you said, look, he was up on a roof working, fell. He is complaining of horrible lower back pain. Horrible, that's all he can focus on. This guy is not intoxicated and he is not on any drugs, which I know everybody's shocked by that. Um, what are you concerned about, Kevin? Uh, probably the pool. Rolling the river. He could, right? Because 35 foot fall, it literally could be anything. He's complaining of low back pain. What are you concerned about down there? Uh, yeah, could be sacrum, right? Lumbar spine. A lot of times with falls, right? If they fall, land on both feet, which, I mean, how many people? That's like a cartoon. But if you fall and land on both feet, the most common trio is you get bilateral calcaneal and lumbar, lower lumbar fractures, okay? Um, so. You bring in a fall, that's the first thing I'm gonna think about this guy. You're like, oh, do your feet hurt too? So this, I, the reason, this is why I got the laser pointer. Um, this guy has a vertical shear, pelvis. Most common thing when you see these is falls, okay? Vertical, right, they fall. And so this is unstable because a pelvis, this is a, you know, the ring of your pelvis. What makes a pelvic fracture unstable is you have injury to the posterior and the anterior aspect. Usually if you only have injury to one part, it's a stable pelvis fracture, okay? This is a vertical shear, so he's actually got a chunk out here too, but he's got a fracture through here and a fracture through here. So, you know, in ATLS and all of our teaching, right, you think pelvic fracture, you put on a binder. In these vertical shear cases, it's actually dangerous to put a binder on. So if they're, you know, this guy's only complaining of lower back pain, his lower back pain is the fracture near his SI joint. He actually had no back fractures. So these are interesting presentations of things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, okay? Um, case three. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so in relation to that, mm -hmm. you're saying that a, a spleen would not be a good thing? So a good chance for him to have? Mm -hmm. Are you saying you would just under it? Well, what we say in ATLS is you put it on. If you're concerned about a pelvic fracture, you put it on. But as the trauma surgeon, as soon as you come into the bay and I okay. shoot a pelvic film, I take it off, right. okay? okay? Because the issue is, is if you saw that open book, right? People can exsanguinate from that open book before they ever get to the CAT scanner. Right. So it's better to have that on so they don't exsanguinate. You know, it's the, you guys in the field see a very different picture than I see when you roll them in the door. Okay, so I will never fault you for having a binder on someone, but when I see that, I'll take it off. Okay, yeah, because that's what's important is bleeding, right? Stopping the bleeding. So just relating to that, we go on quite a few of that, the pelvic band and then the femur, the femoral neck mm -hmm. fracture, and I'm yep. not talking to people with that also. 
It is. So you recommend those to a swing coach? Uh, no, no, because if you think it's, you'll tell by their leg, right? So, and you'll tell by the, the, the case. It's an 89 little lady who like fell out and she's kind of doing this or, well, you're, you know. If he's hemodynamically stable, I would put it on. Yeah, I wouldn't put it on. Okay. It's always an option when you're in route, if they're starting to get unstable, to put okay. it on. Okay. But when you're more concerned about the leg. And this is only with unstable. Yeah, it's only with unstable. So if you, so if you were to yeah. palpate oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's your, it's. Or don't experience it and then you get unstable. Yeah, so if you're really concerned about a pelvic fracture, we used to um, have a, a binder on the table waiting for a lot of bad blunts that would come in that were hemodynamically unstable if we're concerned about the pelvis and just wrap them if it was. But if they're, f if they're stable, there's no reason to mess with it. I guess is the point. That's what Carly's saying. It's for me to remind you guys. Um, so this is uh, number three. You know, because we're the Pacific Northwest, everyone's in a logging truck. Um, this guy, 59-year-old, bad logging truck rollover. It took you guys 30 minutes even to get him out of the truck. The, the, the truck was smashed. Um, he comes in. The thing he's focused on is he's like, oh, God, my right chest hurts and my right leg hurts. My chest, my leg, my chest, my leg. That's all he cares about. So what are you concerned about? This guy took 30 minutes. Oh, God get him out of, oh, I'm a hot mess. Hang on. Um, took 30 minutes just to get him out of the truck. The truck was so smashed. And all he cares about is his right leg, which is common, right? If people have, yeah, it's a distracting injury. Yeah. So your job is to not be distracted. What are you concerned about? Well, obviously, you want to stay awake. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thoracic spine, if you put a stress strain, it could be a stress injury. It could, yeah. It could be anything, right? Yeah. So these are the guys you have to be a little bit more careful with. My God, I can't even put this on my pocket. Hang on, 20 minutes later, I'll get the microphone to work. Um, so this guy was actually interesting because he was just a tough 59-year-old guy. And this is why trauma is an algorithm, right? When people come in, we do the same thing every time because of cases like all of the ones I'm showing you because you can't necessarily just go off their symptoms. You have to go off of what you see, the mechanism that you see, and their vital signs, okay? And all traumas are treated the same way, right? Your A, B, C, D, E. So this guy, he has a destroyed spleen. He was in um, the driver's side, roll over, so he smashed in to the car door and rolled the whole truck rolled multiple times. So I tried to get some good shots. Unfortunately, it's better if I can show you guys the CT scan. But if you look, this is his spleen. So here's uh, the bleeding subcapsularly. This is a part of the laceration, this. So if you can see the change, see how it's dark versus kind of the white around it. So this is dark, this is dark, this is all dark, this is dark here. So uh, this gentleman had a bad spleen he went to, um, his H&H continued to drop, so initially he had no extravasation and was not taken to IR. His H&H continued to drop, he went to IR. Um, they angioembolized him. He is one of the rare cases where angioembolization did not work. He continued to bleed and required a splenectomy, okay? Most people who get a splenectomy come in hemodynamically unstable with a positive fast, we just take them and take their spleen out, okay? So this is a rare case where he actually even went to IR. IR angioembolization did not help, and he ended up losing his spleen. Yeah. Oh, interventional radiology. So they do, uh, they go in with a coil in the femoral uh, artery, put the catheter into the arteries that go to the spleen. Most of what they do now is selective or super selective. They find the exact artery that is bleeding, and they only embolize that, okay? because then you maintain blood flow to the rest of the spleen. Yeah, no, he's not on any of those. He's never seen a doctor. So he's totally fine. Yeah, the, the normal Couve resident. 
totally fine. I have an EF of 25%, but I've never seen a doctor and I'm totally fine. So <laughs> that tends to be what we find when they come in, right? Um, yeah, so you guys will always care about all of that stuff. Then tell us, because obviously sometimes they crash because crash they had an MI. They seized. They, there's way more going on than we're talking about in these short cases, okay? And you guys know to look for all of that. Um, so this is a f uh, case number four. Um, this is an instance of a typical pediatric case. I will say that again. This is a typical pediatric case, okay? I trained at a peds trauma center. I know how to take care of pediatrics, but the problem is with kids, you, we don't image kids. They come in, they get observed, they stay, and if they decompensate, they need somebody who's specialized in treating them. They also need all the family support. They need everything else that goes along with being a kid who was just in a bad accident. So this is a 14-year-old kid. You guys know how bad sledding accidents can be. Walks in with his mom, okay? Um, and she brings him in, she's like, look, he crashed his sled, he just keeps complaining of left shoulder pain, okay? So I'm bringing him in. So mom's concerned, she does the right thing. What are you concerned about? Right, because it's left shoulder pain. Yeah, so that's the key. So what's missed in this kid's workup is initially he just gets a left shoulder x-ray and a chest x-ray, they're fine, okay? So they're like, sweet, drink some juice. How you, you, how you doing? He's like, great, but I really gotta pee. He gets up and they're like, oh, you know, it's okay, you got, you're not, you know, you got rocked, right? He goes, he goes, yeah, have a sandwich. He goes to the bathroom, pees bright red blood, okay? So now what are you concerned about? Yeah, kidneys, right? So in order to have gross hematuria, you, you normally need to have an actual laceration to your kidney, okay? You frequently, injuries just to inside the bladder or the ureters, it, it's not gross hematuria, you'll get micro hematuria, and you might see a little change. But normally if you have gross hematuria, you've got a renal laceration, okay? So then this kid, they're like, well, crap, right? So they scan him. So this is his renal laceration, right the, through the superior pole, okay? And you can actually start to see, see this here? This is his spleen, okay? It does not look good. Can you guys see the difference, dark? lit up. Lit up, a normal spleen is very defined and lit up like this. Dark, dark, his spleen is just crushed, okay? He has no abdominal pain, absolutely zero abdominal pain, okay? This is why when kids come in, you end up observing a lot of these kids, right? They're complaining of shoulder pain and they keep complaining of it and keep complaining of it. And there's no clavicle fracture, there's no shoulder fracture. There's nothing wrong in his ribs because it takes a lot of force to break a kid's rib. So if a kid comes in with broken ribs, that took a lot of force, okay? Non-accidental traumas with a broken rib in a child is a big deal because they're just mostly cartilage. So if a kid's rib is broken, that's a huge deal, okay? It means there was a lot of force. You, kids will get pulmonary contusions, pneumothoraces, large hemothoraces before they will ever break a rib, okay? So these are all important things to remember because this is why kids hang out and get observed. You know, we'll do a chest x-ray, a fast, we'll have him pee and we'll get labs. So the, uh, the thing that was off with him, his LFTs were slightly elevated, his BUN was elevated, not normal for a kid. Um, on a fast, you would have seen free fluid. So you're, if you get just basic things, you can rule out some of the major stuff that would warrant a child to be observed or possibly have an intervention. So the lump palpation, though, were you giving them absence of left upper quadrant? Nope. No abdominal pain. Blood doesn't necessarily hurt right away. But it's still, you didn't feel like, I mean, I think it was an understatement that there's a, a blood loss. No. So we did this. What? What was the fix? Just he just he went across the river. The fix was a pediatric trauma center.
Yeah, he didn't. He didn't end up needing anything. Yeah. Um, but he could have. Okay. I really need you to be the camera. She's just sitting here. She's not helping me out at all. Um. So this is. <laughs> I need way more help than she can provide. Uh, so this is just to remind you that you get referred pain from your diaphragm. So C345 keeps your diaphragm alive. C345 goes to your shoulders. Okay, so irritation of your diaphragm from intra-abdominal processes will give you shoulder pain. It's also why after I do a laparoscopic appy or coli, everybody wakes up and whines to me about their shoulder pain. So I tell them about it before the operation because everybody gets it. Um, case number five, we have a 51-year-old guy who's up, you know, trimming his trees, similarly Pacific Northwest fashion. He's on a, he, he's not in that nice of a harness. He was in some sort of thing with a rope, fell, and then was upside down and proceeded to get smashed into the tree multiple times, okay? Which, I'm like, don't trim your trees. I mean, what, he's 51 too, he still thinks he's young, sorry. What, what are you concerned about? I'm concerned about a possible pelvic thing that makes it hard to bend. Yep. And then anything else that could make the tree fall in certain areas. I don't know whether that's the wrong bone or wrong spot or how yeah. the person is walking. It doesn't look like the pelvic is on the right spot. He's complaining of pain right here. Lower ribs. Lower ribs. Yeah, right side lower ribs. Yeah. Yeah. So he's probably got some sort of rib fractures, right? He's been, you know, swinging pendulum, beating up against a tree. Um, but you break a rib. There's stuff sitting right under your ribs. Okay. Your entire rib cage, pretty much below the nipples, is covering really important crap. So. This guy broke a rib, punctured his liver. So he had a large liver laceration. Um, frequently people will come in with spleens and livers and be hemodynamically stable initially and then change while they're with us in the department because they have time to bleed, okay? So that's this guy's liver. And so this is just to show you again. Look, here's the bottom of your ribs. Look at all of the stuff there. Pretty much your entire liver, your entire spleen, your stomach, your pancreas, your duodenum, all that stuff is right under your rib cage, okay? So if y'all feel your xiphoid, feel, feel right here, feel your xiphoid. Feel the bottom of your rib on the side. You see how much space there is there? If your abdomen's only this big, okay? So there's also, I put this up here to remind you too, the umbilicus is like right here, so you have your, um, bifurcation of your iliacs is around there too, around your umbilicus. So everything's a little bit higher than you think it is. So this is a 21-year-old female. She was in a high-speed MVC. She was an unrestrained driver. She might have had some stuff positive on her talk screen. I know you're shocked. Um, she comes in, so similar to the last case we're talking about, right? She's just like, oh God, my right upper quadrant, it hurts so bad. That's all she's focused on is her right upper quadrant pain. So what are you thinking of? Right. Ribs. Yeah, right upper quadrant. Not Probably not the spleen. But she's, she's probably got rib fractures <laughs> at a minimum. Yeah, take her candy away. Uh, but as we were talking about, under the ribs is the liver. Okay. She was hemodynamically stable en route. When she got to us, her hemodynamics drifted a little bit. Her systolics dropped below 90. She got some fluid resuscitation um, and actually never needed blood. But this is why she dropped. Huge liver laceration, right? Pretty much her entire right lobe was a laceration. Um, she went immediately to interventional radiology. This is a blush right here. And because of, and right here actually too, because of IR embolization, she ended up not needing an operation. She never needed a unit of blood because as soon as she hit the door and became hemodynamically unstable, got resuscitated, she was a transient responder, we say, right? So she initially went up, then starts drifting back down again. 
So she went to IR, they were on site, took her. She did great after that. Yeah, so a blush is when you see on a CAT scan uh, arterial blood outside of a vessel, okay? So it can be called active extravasation, blush. It's when you see bright white outside of a vessel. That's not a vessel. It's bleeding into this actual laceration, okay? So when we see that, we have interventional radiology now that can go in with a catheter and block off that artery that's bleeding. So it's pretty, pretty cool in the last so many years. It means I take out less spleens, but it helps people. So it's important. Uh, next case, 40-year-old. Uh, he was on a motorcycle and was T-boned. Um, I don't know what the motorcycle looked like, but you know he didn't look great. Uh, so what are you concerned about? He's, his focus is his, his pelvis hurts. His groin hurts. You're gonna go like this on his pelvis? Yeah, does this hurt? <laughs> no, right? Okay, okay. You're gonna say, okay, it hurts, sir? That sucks, let's take care of you. Yeah, okay. Um, so you'll do all of your trauma stuff. So he comes in, this space right there, that's not normal, right? They should be like right in the midline. Okay, I have to like point it at the right thing. So, as actually we were talking about in the back earlier, um, you know, pee before you leave a bar, okay? Uh, that's, you know, <laughs> most of the people who come in don't. They don't follow my ABC rules. Um, but this gentleman had not peed before his accident, and he had a bladder rupture. His pelvis actually hurt because he had urine all in his uh extra peritoneal space because of this fracture, okay? So that's an unstable pelvic fracture that caused this. This is a, considered an extra peritoneal bladder rupture. Part of your bladder, uh, it's, all, it's all retroperitoneal, but part of your bladder, if it explodes, will explode into your abdomen, okay? It's called an intraperitoneal bladder rupture. That needs an operation. Extra peritoneal bladder operations, uh, sorry, bladder ruptures tend not to need operations. Sometimes we will fix them when ortho goes in and puts a plate right here to um, realign the pubic symphysis, but most of the time now they don't need any kind of operation. The bladder heals itself, you put in a foley, you keep it decompressed to give the body time to heal it, okay? Um, the, the more common case was, the one I remember the most in fellowship was an off-duty cop who was driving home from the bar, didn't pee, so she came in restrained, right across her bladder. She had a large intraperitoneal bladder rupture that we had to repair. So those are the, the two different ones. But this is, a, this is on a CT urogram, so it gives you a brilliant view of the contrast coming out of the bladder. Um, this is a 27-year-old male, head-on MVC, highway speed. He was restrained, driver, seizure history. That's the seizure, caused him to crash, right? So that's all the other medical stuff you all gotta think about. Um, and he is coming in complaining of right shoulder pain. So this is, he's our driver, right? But he's head on. So you can have a lot of crap broken when you're head on. So he's complaining of right shoulder pain. What are you concerned about? Yeah. Yeah, and all the normal stuff you're gonna think of, right? If he had a steering wheel hit his chest, you're gonna think of a clavicle fracture, a shoulder dislocation, a shoulder, you know, all that stuff, okay? Um, but we're talking about the abdomen, so clearly he's got something wrong with his abdomen. So this is another thing that can happen. So this guy has, interestingly, most of the blood is actually over here on the right side, but he's got, this here is not normal. Your mesentery should look black like that. So around his bowel, he's got this blood, 
He's also got blood that you'll start to see collecting down his uh, right pericolic gutter and down in his pelvis. He has all this free fluid that's the consistency of blood. By, we look at Hounsfield units and it'll tell us what kind of fluid it is uh, approximately. So this kid, um, when he came in, he went from having right shoulder pain to having worse and worse and worse abdominal pain. It just started to progress, okay? It became, it was to the point that it was un, um, it, we call it inconsistent with his exam, right? So if people come in and they have abdominal pain and they're saying, oh, it's hurting worse, oh, it's hurting worse, it's hurting worse, usually what that is is a hollow viscous injury that it's taking time to be painful. Okay, they won't usually hurt initially. It takes time to get painful when you have a, a hollow viscous injury because those are very difficult to see on a CAT scan. So this uh, kid actually ended up having what's called a bucket handle injury. From the um, seat belt, everything got squished, right? And he, the mesentery, which is the like fan of blood vessels that goes to your small bowel, uh, tore, okay? It tore away from the small bowel. So we call it a bucket handle because you can literally grab the small bowel like this, like a bucket handle, okay? So that section was devitalized. He was bleeding into his abdomen and he had a rupture of that bowel. So the uh, other thing you'll see with people with hollow viscous injuries from a seat belt is you'll see lumbar fractures, okay? Same thing, referred pain. Um, so here's some penetrating cases. Uh, that I just did a couple because you don't really have great pictures of penetrating cases, obviously. Um, but this is a lot of the, we are, I wrote down exactly because Carly has numbers. In 2018, we're 95% blunt at Southwest with 4% penetrating. And in the first seven months of 2019, we're 96% blunt with 3% penetrating. Most of our penetrating trauma is self-inflicted, okay? Um, so this was a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the left lower chest. This was somebody uh, intentionally trying to hurt themselves. Uh, she took a gun and pointed at what she thought was her heart, okay? <laughs> so thankfully it was not, because she did not want to die. Um, this, right, so right here, she pointed it right there. So just pretty much below to the left nipple, right? What are you worried about? Left lower chest. A right lower chest. I can't even. It's somewhere, in the body. it's somewhere all up in here. It's actually here. I was pointing to the wrong thing. It's left lower chest. Sorry. I'm pointing to my right side. Yeah. Because remember what we were looking at? If you put your finger on your xiphoid, below your xiphoid and your ribs, that's actually a serious money shot. Okay? There's a lot there. We call it high price realty around the, the pancreas, the duodenum. There's a lot of blood vessels there. Um, so she was completely hemodynamically stable, okay? So because she was hemodynamically stable, the inference is she did not hit a large blood vessel. We do not need to rush her to the operating room if we can get a picture to see what we're actually headed after, okay? So she went and this is where the bullet entered. So this is your liver, right? So it went through the left lobe of the liver. She's got free air, which means she hit some sort of hollow viscous also, okay? Unlikely she hit major blood vessels because if she came in hemodynamically unstable, we just would have rushed her to the operating room, okay? Um, she ended up hitting her left lobe of her liver. She needed a, a liver resection. It was through and through her stomach, so anterior and posterior through her stomach. It also hit her transverse colon, which was uh, got a primary repair. Um, and she survived and was very thankful in the end. Um, this is a 24-year-old male. Um, I don't know, some of you might have brought him in. Uh, <laughs> so this guy uh, was pulling his concealed weapon out of his, um, what, you know, what's this thing called in the car? Console. Console. And uh, I'm like, you really shouldn't have a concealed weapon permit if you're shooting yourself, I'm sorry. I feel like that means it should be taken away. But uh, he was pulling it out and the gun went off. He had uh, hollow point bullets. Because those are needed in everyday life with your concealed permit. Um, so he had a bullet wound just inferior to his umbilicus. Did I give you candy yet? Do you get candy yet? Everybody can have some afterwards. Um, 
what, just below the umbilicus, there's a bullet wound. What are you concerned about? What, what's, what's below that? But also, like vasculature. Yeah, that's your bifurcation. It's a bad, it's a bad spot to accidentally shoot yourself. So, your crew was phenomenal though, and what did they do for a gunshot wound? <laughs> they stripped him. Right? Yeah. They stripped him. Okay? Because if somebody gets shot, you need to look everywhere. Okay? There were absolutely no other bullet wounds, but on evaluation, they did find a foreign body that felt metal that was the size of a bullet. We're just supposed to describe it in the medical record. Uh, right here in his left flank. The gentleman was completely hemodynamically stable, never had a change in his vital signs never tachycardic, never hypotensive. No, it, it was actually just a through and through. He, uh, he had some padding. It's the only time it's good <laughs> to have padding is if you get shot or stabbed. So, you know, the Cleveland, it was always a winner. Um, so here is his entry wound. So at the end right here, this is the entry wound. So that's a bad spot, right? Here is a metallic foreign body. So this guy's completely hemodynamically stable. So he goes to the CAT scanner because we're gonna see if what, you know, what he hit to guide my operation. Sadly for me, uh, he hit nothing. Excellent for him, okay? So this is the trajectory of the bullet through a subcutaneous tissue. He missed absolutely everything with a hollow point. So um, the point of this case really is not to say, oh, everybody's gonna miss everything. But the point of this case is the EMS crew was excellent. They looked at every part of him, right? And he was hemodynamically stable. They, and they told me, they're like, doc, there's something over here on the left side. So it helps guide my emergent sense, right? I mean, I was hoping for an operation, but he didn't need one. Um, this was a recent penetrating case that was very sad. She was a 49-year-old woman who was stabbed repeatedly by her partner. I, she had too many stab wounds to put on here, um, but this is the constellation of some of them, some of the major ones. Uh, the one for this presentation you wanna pay attention to is lower chest, lower chest stab wounds, right? because of the trajectory. So when you have any kind of penetrating injury, you're concerned about the trajectory. The, it will tell you what else to be worried about. So that's why I do the, I like to do the paperclip thing. I find every hole and put a paperclip on it. She had too many um, to put a bunch of paperclips on. But uh, she lost her um, pulses in the field she got return of spontaneous um, circulation with some fluid um, and by the time she got to us, as soon as she hit the stretcher, she lost pulses again. So she ended up getting a left anterolateral thoracotomy. We made it to the OR. She got a clamshell. Um, this one went, her diaphragm was bulging, right? So where, where do you think this one went? Yeah. It hit her liver, right? So it turns into a multi-cavity exploration on x -lap. She had a liver laceration um, and a diaphragm injury that had to be repaired. Uh, but she, when she got to us, her temperature was 32. She'd already, you know, coded in the field. Um, she was unresponsive the whole time and when they got to her. So this patient sadly did not make it, okay? A lot of penetrating victims we can save. Uh, she was not one of them. She was bleeding from everything. So she got your triad of death, right? Cold, coagulopathic, acidotic. Her pH was 7.0. Um, but this is an instance of when somebody comes in, you have to find in penetrating injuries where they all go because the trajectory matters. With that last bullet, trajectory matters, right? Okay, so those are all my cases to go through today. Uh, a clamshell is 
So when we open the easiest access to the heart is through a left anterolateral thoracotomy. Um, if you have injuries on the other side, you can, you can enter the chest in multiple ways, right? You can cut through on the sides or you can cut through in the middle. Um, the easiest access is to cut through on the side. So when she lost pulses as a penetrating trauma, you open the chest, you clamp the aorta if you, know, you feel it's necessary. You evaluate the heart, see if there's any, uh, you open the pericardium to see if there's a pericardial effusion or hemopericardium. Um, and look for injuries to the heart. You can also look for injuries to the lung. Uh, she had a chest tube on the right which had blood, so her pericardium had no blood in it. The assumption is, is that the stab wounds went through her lung, and that's what was causing the bleeding. So to do a clamshell, you then complete that across the entire chest. So you cut through the sternum, and then cut under a rib, and then you open it like that. It gives you a great view of the heart and lungs. Blood? Yeah. Yeah. Looks like a clam. We actually have done a couple of them recently in our ED. <laughs> No, so I never, I never cut the sternum because once you, I, I opened her this way and opened. Because once you're open uh, halfway this way, it's quicker to just open the other way if you need to get full access to the heart. If you're just concerned about the heart, you can just do a sternotomy right away. But that's not something you do in the trauma bay, obviously. Yeah, very few people survive them. Okay, everybody come eat the rest of this candy. I'm not taking it with me. <laughs> well, we'll ask him some questions. Oh. I'll ask him some questions. Okay, yeah, does anybody else have any questions that I can answer? Besides trauma's fun. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, were any of you guys involved in any of these cases? Do you remember them? Oh yeah. Yeah, which one? Yeah. Was he a Russian? Russian. Sure. I have no idea. If it was, then yes. Then yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do have a few log truck rollers. He was rollers, very so. tough, and uh, uh, it took every bit of convincing to save me to not. Yeah. But he did talk to me about it publicly, though. He's like, nah, I'd go home and think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and those are the ones that are concerning because you have no idea what's actually wrong with them because they don't tell you where they hurt. No, they just say wrong yeah, and he ended up losing his spleen. So. Well, I have to have uh, Dr. King back to do chest trauma sometime too, just, you know, but so she can't swear. <laughs>
uh, and, then, and then the flight nurse has to call MRH to figure out where they're going to go. But yes, Randall, what, what would make you want to take that patient to Southwest? Southwest. No airway or you're in the middle of a pediatric code. Okay? Now, do you have to call MRH or do you have to call medical control for permission? No. no. The rule is now if it's in your orders, you take them. If this is now, this is a trauma entry patient. This is not, and I don't care if it's mo full or modified, trauma entry. Okay, if at any point you are scared to death that something bad is happening to the patient, you always have the option to divert to Peace Health, but then you'll get, well then, you know, there are, there are reasons to divert and you talk to, talk to medical control about that. But if the patient is, quote, a trauma entry and they're stable in the point that you have a line in them, you have, uh, you have airway, you have airway control, you don't, or you don't worry about airway control, they go to where the pediatric surgeons are and where they're going to be admitted. If you think that kid's going to be admitted, they're going to go into an ICU, a peds ICU. Okay. All right, Dr. Fedor. He laughs because he likes to see me frag everybody on airway charts. <laughs> and you'll see there's a lot of recurrent themes here. This is primarily a documentation issue, and it almost always is. So I review all the RSI charts, and 99% of them, the, the care is either clearly excellent or presumed to be excellent, just not well documented. So all the all the feedback has to do with just what's in the narrative because we need to see, you'll see the recurrent theme in these cases. Um, the treatment section of the chart does a terrible job of explaining the RSI. Yes, it's check boxes at timestamp stuff, but it doesn't explain to us how your brain's working or why you did what you did. So we need to see a number of things in the narrative, uh, particularly if it's presumed to be a difficult airway or there's multiple attempts, then there's gotta be a lot more documentation um, so these, these charts will illustrate that, and we'll, I almost need a cut and paste template for these reviews because pretty much have the same feedback for everybody. And it's not an individual thing, it's very much a system issue, it's just not how people were trained, and we're sort of onesie twosie getting to people with this feedback. And I am working on making a more systemic approach to this with some improvements in our uh, documentation and developing, a, at least right now with meds, developing an airway module. All right, so there's a couple of cases. This one, as you can see, dispatch code three for an intoxicated male, fire report finding 25-year-old male unconscious in the street, no verbal complaints. Patient's friend stated he was suicidal and drank two and a half fifths of 80 proof alcohol in half an hour, which is pretty impressive. Um, so the rest of the narrative reads, 24-year-old male covered in vomit face down the pavement, small braze into his head, actively vomiting. Patient was moved to the gurney and treated, continued to vomit, was unable to control his own airway. Patient was RSI, transported code three without incident. No complication with RSI, no airway obstructions or trauma. So that's the entirety of the narrative. So the RSI is summarized in one sentence, patient was RSI, um, and really no details. And if we go down through the treatment section, it just doesn't um, give us important details. And I'll tell you the details are important not only for just us to know you're thinking and doing the right stuff, but it helps us see like what our issues are across the county and say with airway training and what we need to improve on. If every, everyone's doing the same thing wrong, then we have, and we have no way to know it. So here we go into the treatment section. I mean, totally reasonable RSI, the guy's actively vomiting his GCS is six, so there's, there's no argument there. We had a pulse ox of 92 initially documented got an IV of an end title of 39, and then we see uh, drugs were pushed shortly thereafter. So mixed in here, we see we have a single intubation attempt, but not a whole lot of other details. We'll see afterwards the SATs are 84%, which is interesting.
So here we got some versed later. I don't see any fentanyl was given. So here's a feedback. This is all stuff I wrote. So for a brief narrative, a lot of good and useful information about the scene and the backstory. I thought it was described really well, like it had a good idea of what was happening. But then, as you noticed in the narrative, there was really no description of how the RSI went. So again, as I mentioned, treatment section does a terrible job of explaining things. It's helpful to explain where the patient was intubated, how they were positioned. This can be done in like three words each. How he was pre-oxygenated and was it successful? Were there any difficult airway indicators? What adjuncts were used? In this case, in the treatment section, they clicked the box, they used cricoid pressure, which we no longer recommend, and didn't really explain why you would think to use cricoid pressure. Um, how the intubation went, whatnot. So and I always, I try to put in all the charts, like this is really the highest risk procedure that we do, the most complex thing that we do um, in our system and as paramedics, so it's really important for us to see good clinical decision making and execution. And also a reminder, we're doing fentanyl first uh, for post-intubation care. Um, so the pre oxygenation thing is important because the last SAT we had on this one in particular said 92%, you know, which is in an ideal place for a patient to be to RSI them, right? So we like to see them get better oxygenation. This may be a documentation issue. This may be the highest they could have got before RSI, but I have no way to know. It's not documented as to why decided to push forward when their SATs were 92. And maybe that wasn't the, the best SAT. That's just sort of where this fell in the, in the time scheme. All right, so this patient's follow-up. They um, were intoxicated and delirious, no surprise. And that was sort of their main deal. So they had what we call metabolic encephalopathy, and they you know, weren't working very well upstairs because of all the alcohol that they had. Um, Let's see if there's any other follow-up on this guy. So he basically woke up, was extubated, and, and went home to resume drinking. That was an editorial that was not in the follow-up. <laughs> All right, case number two, responded co three to a private residence. You'll see a theme here. Uh, patient with severe alcohol, alcohol toxicity. Uh, upon arrival, shown to the back room by family where patient was laying in his bed, soiled in urine. Uh, patient had his pants halfway down, almost made it, and his underwear was in the right place. Um, it is, yeah, they didn't explain that further. I don't know if that meant it was all the way down or all the way up, because if he was just trying to pee and not soil his clothes, then it was probably in the wrong place, um, or he missed the bottle or something. Um, tried to communicate with patient, but no response was received. Patient was slightly moaned with painful stimuli, would never track with his eyes or speak, only moan. Really good description. I love these kind of descriptions. Placed the patient in a tarp, moving blanket out to the gurney. Patient never acknowledged us. Um, patient was secured for transport, loaded into the back of the ambulance. Okay, that all sounds reasonable. Continue to try and arouse the patient with no luck. During transport, the patient began to dry heave and gag, but was still unresponsive. Patient started to clinically deteriorate. To protect the patient, pulled over to RSI, and RSI is successful. Again, that's your entire RSI description. Two words, RSI is successful. Patient was successfully hooked to the ventilator, and the patient's vital signs came back to normal range, upgraded code three, diverted, et cetera. So here we get down to some of the details. Interestingly, the first GCS documented is 15, which you wouldn't expect from the description in the narrative where he was you know, basically covered in urine, not acknowledging, not responding to pain, um, just moaning. So, um, And then down further, um, we have GCS at eight that is documented, which is probably more appropriate to what he was doing. And again, as in the prior chart, we see a SAT of 91% and then a SAT of 85%. And that's the last documented oxygen saturation prior to meds um, being documented. And I completely appreciate that when you go back after the fact and try to put in time, that's super artificial, but it doesn't look good when there's no other data to back it up. So in the narrative, if it said pre-oxygenated patient, SATs were 100 before pushing drugs, like that overrules this sort of artificial treatment section. But this is all we have to go off of, and this doesn't look very good. So afterwards, got midazolam, same thing, doing fentanyl first. Um, GCS, surprisingly, still three after being our side. Um, all right, so this is a long one because 
there's a lot of issues with the case, and a lot of this would have been, I think, corrected with you know, even another little short paragraph in the narrative. So the case itself, I mean, the patient was a, a huge mess. The case was a mess. Seemed reasonable to load and go, and then kind of turned to, turn to crap afterwards. Patient clearly described GCS of four, basically. And then we said about the GCS of 15. Tachycardic in the 150s, yet it was loaded in the ambulance for transport. Um, so it sounds like, you know, GCS was low and he was pretty sick to start with. So you can step back and think, like, was that a good decision or not? But again, it's hard to tell without any explanation of clinical judgment. Um, started a gag, emergent, intubation needed to be performed. He was described as clinically deteriorating, but it's unclear how one could deteriorate from a GCS of four to start with. There's really no description of, of that. Um, zero documentation on the intubation, neither in the narrative. And actually in the treatment section, there's, this was the whole thing. We go from drugs to midazolam. I forgot about that. So there's not even any mention of him being intubated. It's just sort of presumed uh, by the, the two lines in the narrative that this patient was intubated. So this treatment section didn't even include um, any discussion of the intubation whatsoever. Um, so he's received RSI drugs and then nothing is recorded. Um, again, last O2 sat before the drugs were pushed was 82% and hoping he was pre-oxygenated appropriately before drugs were pushed, but it's not, um, not documented. So I just sort of talked about, you know, we do have a non-rebreather, we could use CPAP, we do BVM with a PEEP valve, we have op apneic oxygenation in our protocols. Um, so that's why it's important to give a good summary of the intubation because that would have allayed a lot of this. Yeah, I always say, I say this a lot. You don't want to leave the details to our imagination because <laughs> it almost is never in your favor if we have to imagine what happened on the scene. Um, here I can imagine pretty safely he was our side, um, but there's a lot of things we, we can come up with, a lot of scenarios. Um, physical assessment, which is not what you guys saw, but it was described as extraneous and irrelevant. So. In a drunk patient, we have him listed as his pelvis is stable and his back and head are, quote, symmetric. Um, that was not really that important in his examination. But we do care that he's significantly tachycardic, which is not documented in the exam, and nor were his breath sounds or his sort of neurologic status beyond um, moaning. And we say with sick patients and an intubation, we need better documentation about what we were thinking and what happened. Yes. I know, okay. I like, kind of but if you think about what's important, like yeah. my point, I guess, is more that there were some pretty important features that weren't noted. Right. Oftentimes, we'll see some severe hypotension, an episode of hypotension that was never mentioned, or they were really tachycardic like this guy, and that doesn't seem to have been at least noted to the point that it was written down. Like it's important to know a guy's heart rate is 150, but you know we have the pelvis that's stable. It's like well. So this is just, again, this is not any one person. This is just a systemic problem. We see this all the time. And so we bring up these issues for documentation because you're going through the entirety of the chart and you see important things that are missed and some really irrelevant things that are included. It just doesn't make sense. A lot of it has to do with just the charting system. And I completely appreciate that because we have um, pure hell of a charting system ourselves. And I get it. Um, so this patient was actually admitted multiple times in the past for chronic alcohol use and withdrawal seizures. Um, I don't think he had anything really super exciting. Had a lot of withdrawal, got put on to CWA, which is the um, kind of a standardized way to approach withdrawal symptoms with benzos. Then he woke up and was discharged home a couple days later. I think this is the last one, three cases? Three cases. Uh, discharge code three for shortness of breath, 71 year old, Female, this one's not alcohol, I don't think. Respiratory distress, unable to speak, hypoxic, labored breathing, moving very little air, had wheezes throughout. This is a great description, I love it. Room air sat with 76. Again, that's someone noting an abnormal vital sign. That's relevant, she was very anxious. Placed on CPAP with inline duoneb. Little improvement required further treatment. Labored breathing continued despite treatment and a respiratory drive started to fail. Patient was RSI. Had a very difficult anterior airway. An eye gel was placed for oxygenation between intubation attempts. Intubation was successful. Patient was placed on the vent, transported to code three. Um, so that's an improvement. It's important. Well, I have more follow up, but it's important to document when you think it's going to be difficult. Um, have any kind of physiological or anatomical indicators. 
So that gives that lets us give you a little bit more slack later on. You're like, yeah, it clearly looked like it was gonna suck, and guess what? It did suck. And this was a reasonable progression, so starting with oxygen, moving to CPAP and NEBS, um, which seemed to improve the SAT, so we went from 70s to, to mid to high 90s, um, which is all, all great going down this kind of asthma, COPD pathway. Um, got some methylpred, and we get some Versed, uh, presumably for the CPAP. Zofran, Mag, all reasonable. And then just didn't do well, right? So we're going down stepwise fashion, not doing well. Needs an RSI, which is great. So it's not a Tominate, we got sucks. The last pulse ox documented is, is also reasonable. And then we see our SATs drop, presumably, you know, pulled out in there and attempted to reoxygenate. I love the idea of the IGL for reoxygenation. I think that's really clever. Um, so here, again, this is not in the, in the narrative. We just have to kind of pick it out of this dense paragraph here. So we have cricoid pressure, which again is not explained and is no longer recommended for anybody. Um, further on down, can we tell how many attempts? There we go, two attempts. But we can't tell what happened in between, which is really important. So, so yes, yeah, not why. Well, why is great. If you have a why of like you couldn't get it, that's great to find out. But when I, when I was working uh, in my job in Australia where they had a huge airway focus, they would always say that if you can get the airway on the fourth attempt, you should have been able to get it on the first attempt. And, and that's true. And we want to know why, like what was the difference? So like I elevated her head a little bit more, or we suctioned better, or we changed the light. Something simple, something has to change. You can't just pull out and do this, go in right away and do the exact same thing. Change something. Blade size, operator, head position, your position. Something super simple. I just lifted her head up a little bit. Again, that's a you know three-word, half-set explanation because that can help us. We're like, man, we've got a bunch of people getting second attempts when they, you know, whatever, like kneel instead of lay down. Then we can say, hey, maybe we should come back around as a whole group and talk about positioning more to try to optimize our first pass success. So that's why that's important, and we want to make sure that people really aren't getting like stuck on stupid and just making eight attempts the exact same way in which we've seen, not with you guys, um, with one of our flight services. Um, and we just wanna make sure that people are thinking outside the box and are trying to improve with every attempt because we don't expect first pass success for everybody, it's not possible, but we just wanna see like a thoughtful process. All right, so there's the, the issues, um, this is what I came up with. Seeing the patient care are well described in the narrative, clear indication for treatments given in the RSI, the start of a good description of the intubation itself, like the explanation of difficult airway, what they did between attempts was awesome, but there are limited details on what else happened. Um, particularly in the case of a difficult airway and multiple attempts, we need more details in the narrative. This is a, an ongoing thing. So the crazier the case is, the sicker the patient, the harder the procedure, we just need more documentation. We see some really crazy cases with super small narratives, right? There had to be more because this is clearly a you know, really sick patient or the RSI was a nightmare, like it just has to be documented. So just think about it. the harder it is, like the more you should write. And I, and I also appreciate that trying to get charts done in the middle of running back-to-back -back calls is a complete nightmare, and I get it. But we don't have that many super sick people on a shift, um, whether in the ED or pre hospitally so just try to put an extra like, you know, two minutes into the RSIs. All right, particularly in the case, I talked about that. How was she pre -oxygenated? Was it successful? We'd love to see that. Um, there were some really low SATs documented in the treatment section, but we can't tell the level she was RSI'd at. So between, in a five minute period, there's SATs of 97 down to 80, and we can't really tell like what was it before intubation. I'm gonna presume it was the 97%. Um, how was she positioned, which is super important in the setting of an anterior airway. So is this a patient who was laying flat on the ground? Are they up on a gurney? Do they have ear to sternal notch? We don't know. But if it's an anterior airway, we gotta think about making some changes. Maybe thinking about using the video and not DL perhaps even. Um, was, why was cricoid pressure used? And then there's a 45 minute gap. We can go back and look at it. There's a 45 minute gap between blood pressures and they're pretty different. Let me see if we can find it. And this is a little bit different than what I have to see normally, but let's see if there's any blood pressures documented. Probably not. Do you see one? Yeah, there's one more 
One more back. Okay, great. Let's see. Yep, good eye. So let's see if we can find another one. So ideally, we'd like a blood pressure. There you go. Ideally, we like a blood pressure right before intubation and right after because we know that as soon as you push drugs, as soon as you do positive pressure, they're going to drop their pressure potentially if they're at all remotely shocky, certainly in trauma patients. And so that's 151, the 83 over whatever it was. And then it's back here, super, you know, so something happened. Um, there were heart rates documented in there, but there was not another blood pressure. And so it's a big discrepancy. So that's just sort of a reminder about blood pressures. Um, and said overall the care was great. It was a, both an anatomically and a physiologically difficult airway. So she was hypoxic, was a sick lady, so that's physiologically difficult. Did really well to, to mediate that and improve her oxygenation. And then it was anatomically different, uh, difficult with the anterior airway. So I think those are those are well mediated and, and successfully managed, but we just need to see more documentation. So like I said, I can cut and paste a lot of these on almost every RSI chart. That's what I was going to say about that. And again, this is a, a recognized system-wide issue and something I'm putting a lot of focus on too and just you know, trying to work on training, work on streamlining this so you don't have to put so much thought into it. But right now it's just kind of, you know, we have what we have to, to work with. So just think about improving your narratives, just explaining, making a small little paragraph about every RSI you do and just explaining why you did what you did, kind of how you set yourself up for success and what happened. Um, and the near future, we'll hopefully have a better um, data form for that. Mm, oh yeah, we have some follow-up on her too. She's actually, was this was last week, week and a half ago, she was still in the ICU. Um, I think it was extubated, but was still not doing a whole lot at the time. Oops. Um, any questions? I know this is always contentious because airway's a sexy thing and, and we like to RSI and nobody likes to be shit on. Sorry, um, and we try to be nice, but you know, a lot of this is really, you know, I promise this is a big system problem and it's rarely an individual thing. It's just something that no one was ever, you don't have an expectation for how to document and we're trying to develop that um, over time. So we just show these cases to show, discuss like what we're seeing and what we would like to see and, and that's a slow move on the needle, you know, it's kind of turning a big ship. see lots of nodding, which means it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those things are fine. I love to see that. I love to hear the scene. We just need a slight narrative about the RSI procedure itself, you know, all the portions of that which could be super brief. I write them for all of mine too. And it's, you know, it's like a three, four line mini paragraph, just summarizing, you know, patient position this way, or ear to sternal notch, they had oxygenation this way, their sats were hundred percent, blah, blah, blah. You know, it could be pretty fast. Yeah. I won't make one up right now, but. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple. We've had a couple of really good ones um, to see we can de-identify and just sort of send out kind of good exemplars of what those look like. Again, you're trying to shoot for a target that you can't see right now. You know, so we're trying to build the target <laughs> so you can understand what you're aiming for. Um, yes, but we could definitely do that. So. Anything else? Yes. Correct. No, the new change the new protocols it's I forget what it says it's discouraged I think because in the old days we used to think it prevented aspiration and regurgitation it doesn't do that in the research it, it doesn't prevent aspiration or regurgitation and it screws up your view so it affects your ability to to see the airway clearly distorts your anatomy and doesn't help yeah, so now we talk about doing the, we call it extra laryngeal manipulation. So cricoid is just a blind squash it while you're intubating. ELM is you taking your hand and just moving the, the larynx around till you find a good view and then having somebody hold it for you. So it's a little bit of a, a distinction. So we're, we advocate for that, but not the blind cricoid pressure. 
That's it? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.